Good morgen, meine Freunde, and welcome to what is my first and hopefully my last unabashed fanboy video. This started out as a usual story, a typical story, but I felt it was one that needed to be told with love, and this certainly is an artist that I have a great deal of love for. That notwithstanding, this is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Dusty Springfield. There's a long-running joke about the American search for a new Bob Dylan and the varying degrees of hilarity in the failures that have resulted from that. In Britain, there's an equally long-running and equally futile quest, the search for a new Dusty Springfield. Many have tried, but all have failed to take Dusty's ultimately unassailable crown. This is a story of how she earned that crown, how it slipped from her fingers and how at the last gasp, she managed to catch it back. Mary Isabel Catherine Bernadette O'Brien was born into relatively comfortable middle-class circumstances in North London in 1939. How long those circumstances persisted after those utter swine, the Luftwaffe, bombed her hood during the Blitz is unknown. But what is known is that she and her brother Dionysius were raised by a music-loving family of dubious psychiatric health, her dad especially was a very eccentric fellow, and that Mary made her earliest recordings age 12 and her earliest professional recordings as part of the Lana Sisters in 1959. Mary had picked up the nickname Dusty when she was around 10 years old on account of her tomboyish scrapping with local boys in street football games. In 1961, Mary, her brother Dion and Tim Field formed a folk trio, appropriating Tim Field's surnames as the Springfields, Dion becoming Tom Springfield and Mary adopting her established sobriquet of Dusty as Dusty Springfield. Positioning themselves as an English equivalent of Peter, Paul and Mary and using Tom's songwriting and arranging skills, they racked up three quickfire British hits, Dear John, Breakaway and Bambino, but soon realised that their true strength was Dusty's uniquely powerful, expressive and erotically edged voice and began to push that forward. They also replaced Field with the more instrumentally adept Mike Hurst. It was this change that saw their fifth single, Silver Threads and Golden Needles, break into the top 20 on the US Billboard pop charts, the first British group ever to do so. Two months before Telstar by the Tornadoes and 15 months before the Beatles. It also made number one in Australia. As well as Dusty's still nascent but obviously wonderful voice, another key element of Silver Threads and Golden Needles was Mike Hurst's excellent guitar solo. After a few more US and British hits though, Dusty, tired of the folk formula and Tom's control of the group and, legend has it, after hearing tell him by the exciters on the radio in Nashville, decided to quit the group and pursue a more soulful sound. Dusty's debut single, I Only Want to Be With You, is as close to a standard as a pop rock record ever could be. A hit four times over in the UK and Australia, and three times over in the US, the song was sourced for her by the Springfields producer Johnny Franz from the then hot songwriter Mike Hawker and Maverick arranger Ivan Ramon, an unsung hero of pre-psychedelic English pop. Dusty soon found Ramon much more amenable to her ideas than Franz, and Franz soon found his producer title as an honorary one as Dusty herself took control of the sessions. Raymond and Dusty immediately established her initial and some would say everlasting sonic template. Up-tempo stompers with huge booming brass, strings that not only emphasized but added weight. Dusty's voice, here still a little pop but soon to add whole new subtleties and coarsities of phrasing. And a drummer, Bobby Graham, so far off the hook that he makes Keith Moon sound like a Salvation Army Band member. Bobby Graham played on over a hundred UK top 40 hits, although never on a number one. Most famously, You Really Got Me by The Kinks or perhaps Gloria by them. 
On her ballads, the arrangements emphasise Dusty's unique and to this day unapproached erotic mezzo-soprano, her wonderful phrasing and a great ear for complex, often arty songs. I Only Want to Be With You made Dusty the second British actor hit on the US charts after the Beatles, entering those charts at the end of January 1964 and peaking at number 12. She also sang it on the first ever episode of the legendary British TV show, Top of the Pops, where she appeared 42 times. Dusty doubled down on her next single, the less successful but in my opinion superior Stay A While, 1 minute 57 seconds of sheer pop joy wrapped in a louder, harder, more manic arrangement where Dusty knows exactly what she wants from her vocals. Martha Reeves, but darker, smokier and sexier. April 1964 saw Dusty's first album, A Girl Called Dusty, notable for its wide range of American influences from 50s R&B jazz crossovers to Motown, which to be fair doesn't always work, to its remarkable version of Leslie Gore's You Don't Own Me, transmogrifying it from a pointed song of teen defiance and emancipation into an anthem for sexual independence, especially the way Dusty backs off and de-emphasizes the phrase, I can't go with other boys. What it does introduce is that art ballad style of hers, best captured on my colouring book, which in my opinion, and I freely admit to a dusty can do no wrong bias in most things, crushes, atomizes, obliterates Barbara Streisand's stiff, stagey version from her second album. Dusty's version is human, frail, yearning, blue. British pop had never gone this far, and in that particular niche, America still looks stiff and hidebound in comparison. The other highlights include the immortal Wishin' and a Hopin' and a slamming, outrageous version of Ray Charles's Don't You Know to close the album. Dusty took her association with Backrack and David to a new high on her next single, I Just Don't Know What To Do With Myself. Here Raymond surpasses himself, constructing a clean, articulate wall of sound which builds with Dusty's vocal. Dusty turns that vocal from straight pop songbird on the opening verses to an increasingly emphatic and frantic shout, one of the central glories of English invasion pop. It's records like this that explain why they never did find another Dusty Springfield. But as her star shone brightly on the charts and in her art, there was a dark, dark cloud gathering in Dusty's future. In December 1964, Dusty was deported from South Africa for performing to integrated audiences. Now, let's be clear here. Dusty had signed a contract to tour stating explicitly she would only perform for integrated audiences and would not perform for segregated audiences. And she signed this in the UK with UK and South African promoters. Of course, no one told those utter swine in the South African government and the tour was canceled and Dusty was sent packing. This left a great deal of animus amongst certain impresarios in the UK who lost money on the tour and gradually Dusty's billings started to diminish. What it did do, however, was make a hero out of her with the people she thought really were important, the black music community in the US. And admire her as they did, they never quite bought the records and the numbers Dusty needed. But all this tumult never showed in her music, which kept going from height to height. Her second album, Everything's Coming Up Dusty, kicked off with an on-point cover of Aretha Franklin's It Won't Be Long, which set the tone. Dusty was now a soul pop singer as opposed to a pop soul singer. Her phrasing on the old war horse, Goffin King's Oh No Not My Baby, is a dead giveaway. The show tune Who Can I Turn To, and particularly the superb I've Been Wrong Before, one of Randy Newman's first hits, continues her mastery of the big ballad, Sarah Vaughan's Doodlin' fills the jazz slot that Do Re Mi took on her first album. I Can't Hear You No More is some good, souped up, sold up Carol King following Betty Everett's example. And the album ends with a version of Claire Awards packing up a full on gospel song. One wonders if Dusty in 1965 knew about Clara's long relationship with Aretha Franklin's father CL and how much of a tribute off handed or otherwise that song might have been. Very good as it all is, on the whole though it lacks the heft of the debut album. Dusty sits much higher in the mix and to allow this Raymond's arrangements aren't as propulsive and powerful. Plus, 
That's How Heartaches Are Made is the first genuinely duff song she ever recorded. More soul-oriented singles followed, in the middle of nowhere and little by little until she finally had the dominating chart breakthrough of You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, a song she picked up at a song festival in Italy. Not understanding the lyrics in Italian, she gave it to her friend Vicky Wickham to see if she could find a lyricist for it. As it happened, Wickham was having dinner at the time with Simon Napier-Bell, the manager of the Yardbirds, and the two of them conspired to write the lyrics themselves as an anti-love song, which they did so in an hour, writing most of it in the cab on the way to a nightclub. When Dusty came to record the vocal, unhappy as she usually was with the acoustics in the Phillips recording studio, she set up as she'd done before in the ladies' bathroom, but found it too bright for her liking, so she moved the mics into an alcove under the staircase between the control room and the studio floor, and cut what many think was her greatest ever vocal, and many others think is one that ranks with the finest vocals on a pop record ever. The great record buying public certainly agreed, sending it to number one in the UK and top five almost everywhere else in the world. By 1967, after being named Britain's most popular female vocalist at the NME Poll Winners Contest, at which the Beatles played their last British concert, the backlash from her South African tour began to bite at Dusty. So much so that by mid-1968 she was reduced to playing cabaret and working men's clubs. The BBC and television in general remained supportive, hosting three variety series for the BBC and one for ITV, which included a famously now lost appearance by the Jimi Hendrix Experience, where Jimi duetted with Dusty on Mockingbird. Her 1967 album, Where Am I Going, was aptly titled, with Dusty turning away from the harder soul sound to a more sophisticated form of adult pop, albeit with Ivor Ramon being phased out in favour of other arrangers. The album has more than its share of winning cuts. The opening trio, Bring Him Back, I Can't Wait to See My Baby's Face and Take Me For A Little While, are all great but it does reach depths unplumbed by her two previous albums, namely in her versions of Sunny, Close to You, and Come Back to Me. While I'm not crazy about Welcome Home as a song, her vocal is marvellous, the kind of wonder she could only conjure up. Equally, you'd think that Jacques Rail's If You Go Away would be tailor-made for her, but she just sounds like anyone singing it. She does a nice job on Brother Tom's Broken Blossoms, which perhaps should close the album, and the title track is rightly beloved by fans. Her real triumph of 1967, in fact, is her Oscar-nominated theme from the James Bond spoof Casino Royale, The Look of Love, an object lesson in erotic longing from Bacharach and David. After the relative commercial flop, Where Am I Going?, Phillips dropped their American option on Dusty's contract. She was snapped up promptly by Atlantic. In conversation with Ahmed Erdogan, Erdogan asked Dusty, had she heard of a certain hot new English band he was thinking of bidding for? Oh, she said, or words to that effect, John Paul Jones has been my backing bassist for years. If they're good enough to get him to walk away from all that money he makes playing sessions, they must be good. And, as Erdogan said, it was on that sole recommendation that he went and made Led Zeppelin the first ever $100,000 unsigned band, $143,000 to be exact. Her 1968 album, Dusty Definitely, was an uneven affair, so much so that Atlantic didn't even pick it up. Beginning with the avalanche of soul that was Dusty's version of Gladys Knight and the Pips Ain't No Sun Since You've Been Gone, the album slowly gets less interesting as Dusty seems to be searching for some kind of AOR sound. All is forgiven, however, with I Think It's Gonna Rain Today. A great song, a great Randy Newman song, a vocal that is so desperately soulful without any of the affectations that accompany the genre, and a nasty little pang of cynicism at the end. Unable to work in England and desperately afraid that the press would out her as a lesbian, Dusty headed to the United States where she was to work with Jerry Wexler on what was her biggest flop at the time but today stands as a career-defining gesture. Dusty in Memphis. Wexler was amazed by how difficult it was to work with Dusty. She refused to commit to any song she found. Dusty says that that isn't true. She agreed to Son of a Preacher Man and Just a Little Lovin'. And she had no confidence at all in her own voice. So much so that eventually she left the Memphis sessions and recorded her master vocals to a rhythm track in New York. 
Still, she'd insist on the track and her headphone being played back so loudly she was incapable of hearing her own voice. Wexler described it as the threshold of pain. And yet Dusty rediscovered her sense of nuance, her sense of authority over a lyric and that sense of sexual edge that made her best record shine. And she laid them on every single track, even Windmills of Your Mind, which she detested. By my count, there are eight all-time classics on the album. Just a Little Lovin', Son of a Preacher Man, I Don't Want to Hear About It, Don't Forget About Me, Breakfast in Bed, Just One Smile, No Easy Way Down, and I Can't Make It Alone. Three of them by Goffin and King, as well as a fourth and the only slightly less great So Much Love. Even though the album didn't sell anything, her golden era had ended on its highest notes. But few artists, have fallen so precipitously, so quickly. Let's not dwell on the subsequent dozen or so sad years for Dusty, as the inner conflict with her sexuality, she did come out in public in 1972 as one of the very first artists to do so. Professional and personal disappointments and an undiagnosed bipolar disorder ravaged her, leading to alcoholism, cocaine addiction, self-harm, seclusion, domestic violence and periods of homelessness and poverty. The horror stories of Dusty and the degradations heaped upon her in that time are legend. It wasn't until she got herself back into England in the early 1980s and back to her support network. It was then that she got back to work, culminating in her US and UK number two with the Pet Shop Boys, What Have I Done to Deserve This? Kept from number one in the UK by bloody Rick Astley. That's disrespectful. But I'm not going to end it there. There's one more record to essay, and that's her final, A Very Fine Love, a supremely confident adult pop album with Dusty in great voice, and the gem on it, the song worthy of inclusion on any Dusty Springfield playlist, is a cover of an old Dottie West hit, Where Is A Woman To Go, where she summons up every fibre of what Dusty Springfield is and what Dusty Springfield was capable of doing with a song. Soulful, coy, defiant, supremely evocative. When did an artist ever put a better final track on their final album? At the beginning of the sessions for A Very Fine Love, Dusty took sick and had frequent bouts of laryngitis and other maladies during the three months recording. On arriving home and seeing her doctor, a diagnosis of breast cancer was delivered. Following treatment, the cancer appeared to go into remission and Dusty commenced a round of appearances which went in some great way to cementing her legend as a British national treasure and the Queen of English soul. But sadly, the cancer returned and in May 1999, we lost the great Dusty Springfield. I remember that sad, terrible day, like it was yesterday. But let's not be sad for what we lost. Let's live in the miracle of what we were given. Every ounce of joy, every nuance of sadness, every shade of blue and whoop of abandon she sang and sang like no other should be treasured. Even in her worst times, there was always something on one of her records that kept alight our faith in her and her supreme craft and gift. Hers was a life cruelly lost, but at least it was a life meaningfully lived. As Mary O'Brien and forever as Dusty Springfield.